Dreadeff presents Healthcare Stories Louise Custer and Charlie Custer Part 2 Interviewed at the Ed Roberts Campus, Berkeley, California, October 2012 There was a period at the end of my husband's life. He had a rare cancer and he was not well. And I got a phone call uh, that Charlie hadn't been feeling well for several days. And Charlie is unable to discuss when he's not feeling well. He can break a limb and no one will know until it begins to swell. When I asked the staff what they thought was going on and how Charlie was manifesting himself physically, they said that he was leaning forward as if his stomach was hurting him. And I immediately began to suspect um, appendicitis. And this was already several days after he was unwell. I immediately asked them to go in and get a white cell count, which they did. And by they did not do that stat, which would have meant that the results would have been rushed to the physician. They just did a regular blood test. And that later in that evening, we learned that he had a high white cell count. I then uh, knew I was not with Charlie. I would, had to be with my husband at that particular point. And I told the staff that um, I wanted them immediately to have this addressed, but it turned out that the physicians wanted a CAT scan before anything further was done, and they waited until the following day for the CAT scan. So when Charlie finally got the CAT scan, it was revealed he had appendicitis. They rushed him into the surgery at at 8 o'clock at night, but we are now four days into the infection uh, setting off. And he has the surgery. Um, it seems that the surgery goes well. He's actually in the hospital for nine entire days, which is very demanding. And at the very end, the day, just the evening, the late, the evening before Charlie was to be discharged, I happened to be in his room when a nurse was about to give him several medications and I asked, what is it you're giving him? And she said, oh, these are two um, antibiotics that he needs. And I said, I need to talk to the surgeon. Uh, that those, that's two, two more drugs in his regimen. I have to be sure that he has checked that these drugs are not going to be problematic with his seizure disorder or interacting with his current drug regimen. I called a physician and he was very dismissive. He said to me, well, <laughs> he had, um, you know, he had an infection. Um, this, um, the, he, we require very strong drugs. I said, but have you vetted these drugs for interactions? Well, you know, he needs these drugs. He has to have them. I was not the least bit happy, but I, he'd had peritonitis, meaning he'd had this infection, and so I accepted it. Two days later, Charlie is discharged, he's at home, and he begins to have seizures. Charlie seizes on and off throughout the days for almost two entire weeks. We opted to um, not immediately send him back into the hospital to get Dilantin. We were hoping to keep him out of the hospital. We didn't want, we wanted to try some other alternatives that the neurologist had suggested, Ativan, but the Ativan just knocked Charlie out and did not give him what he needed in order to control the seizures. It wasn't until virtually two weeks later that we get a phone call from Charlie's lead staff who says, he's gonna be in the hospital tonight if we don't do something. And it was my husband, neither of his neurologists, but my dying husband who looked up and said, I have an idea, let's give him a low dose of oral Dilantin and then put him on just a, a maintenance dose. We called, arranged for that. We had already been in touch with the on-call physicians. It was nighttime. They agreed to it and lo and behold, it stopped the seizures in, in their tracks. But it was an absolute dance with the devil that we had made, almost a pact. Because by agreeing to use Dilantin, a drug that we knew was not good for Charlie in the long term, we had used it in the past to try and control seizures, but it led to serious behavioral issues. So 
we start out where delirious that the seizures have start, stopped. He has a good first month, in fact, a very good first month. Seizures are way down. But the second month, he's starting to have more behavioral issues. By the time three months have passed, my husband has now died. I get a phone call the day after my husband's memorial that's telling me that Charlie has gone into hyperspace. He's tipping over tables, he's pulling over books from the bookshelves. They're going to send him up to San Francisco and he's going to have to be admitted to the hospital. What unfolds is, is a tale of such sadness it's hard to recount because I spend one night in the hospital with five different drugs being thrown at Charlie to try to get these um, behaviors under control. Nothing is working. Finally, they give him Valium. I'm then told that the hospital cannot provide services to Charlie. They don't have the behavioral setting he needs. We decide that he needs to go to another hospital, so we send him to another of the most prestigious hospitals in the Bay Area. And while he's there, Charlie is mismedicated three times, not on any other drugs, but on his own medications. As the, as the nursing staff is about to give Charlie his drugs, my staff looks and says, wait a minute, that's not right. You know, I have a theory about why Charlie was mismedicated um, with his own drugs. My staff reported that this psych unit the staff was wholly unprepared to deal with a severely disabled young man. They were not used to having a young man with seizures. They were not used to having someone who could not himself articulate what his issues were. He was reliant on his staff, and my staff reported that the nursing um, team that worked with Charlie there actually showed that they weren't comfortable being near him, they weren't comfortable addressing him, and they most certainly weren't comfortable um, talking about what his real needs were. So that when it came to administering his own meds, there was almost, I would say, a blocked soul and a mind that was not predisposed to, to taking Charlie's deepest needs. They wanted Charlie probably to not be on their ward. And in the course of blocking their openness to him, they allowed themselves to do something that was absolutely unprofessional and unethical, to mismedicate a patient more than once. Fortunately, if my staff had not been there, you cannot imagine what would have happened if Charlie had not gotten enough of or too much of the multitude of anticonvulsant drugs and behavior meds that he's on. I immediately pulled him from that hospital. We have him at home down in Santa Cruz. He's a wild bit of an animal. And my regional center caseworker comes to me and says, Charlie must now be sent to what is called a dual diagnosis setting. This is a setting to which people with developmental delays who also have a psychiatric diagnosis are brought. And the only one that's available is not in the Bay Area, not in Northern California, but seven hours away in near Los Angeles. Charlie and I are driven in the dead of night in a limousine down to the hospital in Southern California that is in the end not a hospital at all, but really a psychiatric unit, where he is left for the sole purpose of taking him off the Dilantin, because we realize now that in a very paradoxical way, the Dilantin has so suppressed Charlie's seizures that the seizure activity, what we call subclinical seizures, is so fierce that he is going quietly mad. The agreement with the psychiatrist at the institution that we've taken him to is completely clear. We want some seizures. We are taking Charlie's Dilantin down, and that is what is going to bring him back to stability and allow him to go back home. Ten days into his stay at the institution, 
Charlie has a 30-second seizure, which in our universe is a virtual non-seizure. And I get a phone call that an internist at the setting has immediately taken the liberty of raising Charlie's Dilantin, not titrating it, but taking it immediately right back up to the level at which he came into the institution. And this is end game. They will not allow any seizures. So we have a complete disconnect between the psychiatrist who made the agreement with us and the uh, internist who's decided we can't have any seizures in this setting. We have a, a few days later a roundtable discussion with everyone at the team there and my caseworkers on speakerphone. We're as much as told that Charlie's okay now, he can go home, even though he's still at the level of Dilantin he was on. And the staff, when I say, that's great, we'll take Charlie home, I hear from my staff on the speakerphone at this meeting, Louise, we can't bring him home. We're not ready to take home someone who is in as much extremis as Charlie is. His behaviors had calmed some, but he was not at all ready to be in a safe setting at home. So for another two, and, uh, two, two, two weeks, Charlie at $1,250 a day, is kept in this institution, getting none of the treatment he needs and none of the reduction of the dilantin that is going to bring him back to a normal level. This is the crisis that we're facing here in California. We do not have adequate dual diagnosis crisis centers for our adults and young people. When this incident occurred, it became clear we needed another option. When I made investigations to see what other options there were, the only suggestion that was made that Charlie was that Charlie would go to a developmental center and that if he were in crisis again, his need would be taken care of there. We did all that was necessary to get him set up there for a future crisis, only to learn two years later that Due to the funding cuts, the Sonoma Developmental Center would not be able to help Charlie, and there was no option there. I did extensive research in the state of California to, to identify other dual diagnosis crisis settings. There was only one, and when we went to apply to, this is other than the, the, the setting in, in LA, when uh, I went to, we went to apply to have Charlie considered there, we suddenly got word that that institution was not able to take any more referrals because there had been some problems there, they had been cited, and all referrals were now stopped. Healthcare Stories, made possible with generous support from the Special Hope Foundation. For more information, visit dreadf.org slash healthcare dash stories. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 3.0 Unported License.